Do we still have people in the waiting room, Lawrence, or have they joined now? They're coming in now. Perfect. Should see them populating now. I do. All right, great. Well, why don't we just get started? So hello, everyone. And Welcome to our second session of the virtual SAGE ACJS Faculty Development Workshop. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Lorenzo Boyd about teaching about race and justice in 2021. Just a quick introduction, my name is Jessica Miller and I'm the sponsoring editor for our criminology and criminal justice list here at SAGE. And I'm joining you today from my home office just outside of Houston. Also on the call today is um, from SAGE is Josh Perigo, our acquisitions editor for the discipline. Before we jump into our workshop for today, I wanted to share a little bit about SAGE. Most of you know SAGE as an independent publisher of high quality textbooks and resources for the social scientists. Uh, what most people don't know is that SAGE was founded in 1965 by Sarah Miller McCune when she was just 24 years old. Sarah had a dream and mission to support the dissemination of usable knowledge by publishing innovative high quality research and content that was being overlooked by the large scale publishing houses at the time. In just nine months, she was able to put out Sage's first journal, Urban Affairs Quarterly. If you fast forward 55 years to today, Sage is a global company with offices in California, Washington, DC, London, Singapore, New Delhi, and Melbourne, publishing over a thousand journals and 900 books every year, as well as library products and services. Throughout all of that, Sage has remained independent and a staunch advocate for developing new fields of inquiry, translating research into policy, and meeting the needs of students and instructors across the social sciences. Uh, with the announcement that ACJS will be virtual in 2021, which is a decision that we do support, uh, but still mourn at the same time. You know, I know I was looking forward to seeing so many of you in person. Um, but we did want to make sure we continued to offer this workshop, even if it was in a virtual format. So thank you so much for joining us today and just helping us keep that engaged scholarship that's such a vital part of our discipline. Uh, I've been with SAGE for almost eight years and I've seen how you do, or I've seen how it really does matter, not just what you do, but why you do it. And for SAGE, this starts with a deep commitment to the academic community, and that's why we're all here today. Uh, we know that this is still just a very trying time for you, even a year into this pandemic. And just want you to know that we are here to support you every step of the way as we look to see how we can use this workshop just to help improve our connections, improve our teaching methods. And we're just really thrilled that you're here today or watching the recording of this session. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our amazing workshop coordinator, a distinguished scholar himself and author of White Collar Crime, Brian Payne. Thank you, Jessica, and uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm not going to take a lot of your time this afternoon because you, you didn't come here to hear me, but uh, I do want to thank you for, for coming this uh, Monday afternoon, and uh, we're so excited to be continuing our SAGE ACJS Professional Development Workshop, and I did want to uh, point out that the next, we, we do have the rest of them scheduled, and uh, one of them uh, will, will be about a month from now, and you'll be getting an email about that. It'll be Joanne Belknap talking about teaching social justice. Uh, another one will be on uh, teaching policing, and that will be held by Jacinta Gallo. And then we'll have one uh, that I'll lead called uh, Games Criminologists Play. And, and that'll be sometime during the summer. We, we haven't picked the date yet, but we'll just uh, be talking about the types of games that we, we use to uh, help teach about crime and justice. And then our wrap up uh, workshop will be in September. That one will be, uh, we, we have uh, a very exciting uh, Zoom room planned where we'll have a number of scholars that'll be in different breakout rooms where you'll have the opportunity to have a, a very uh, a very uh, small room feeling discussion with those uh, those criminologists. And, and we're very excited about that one as well. We're most excited though right now about uh, hearing from Dr. Lorenzo Boyd, who's currently the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of New Haven. Uh, those of you who, uh, who know him, know him as Lorenzo, and uh, he is a, a nationally recognized leader in police community relations and 
an authority on urban policing, diversity issues in criminal justice, race and crime, and criminal justice systems. I first met Lorenzo two decades ago, more than two decades ago, when he worked with us at Old Dominion University. He uh, was uh, finishing up his PhD at the time, and he would completed 14 years working in the, the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department and working in policing corrections in the courts. And we, we had the opportunity to have Lorenzo here while he was finishing his dissertation. In fact, I had the honor of being on Dr. Boyd's uh, d dissertation committee and uh, very well thought out research he did then that has led into what he's been up to over the past two decades. Now, those of you who, who uh, are familiar with Lorenzo know he's held many uh, important uh, roles in our discipline, including being a former president of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, he's a lifetime member of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, and he's been uh, well uh, situated to be a part of the national conversation, uh, especially what's going on now with the, the George Floyd trial. Uh, he's also a, a big time Patriots fan, I should point out. Uh, back, he used to post about the Patriots on, on MySpace back when MySpace was a thing and he had Tom Brady to hide behind. Uh, but, but this past year has been the first year when we didn't really get to hear Lorenzo say much about the Patriots. And I gotta tell you, being one of his Facebook friends, it was, it was uh, quite refreshing. But anyway, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to hear Professor Boyd talk to us about uh, teaching about race and justice in 2021. So Lorenzo, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Brian. And thank, thank you everybody for uh, coming in. Thank you, big thank you to SAGE and ACGS for continuing the professional development workshop, even uh, as we go through this pandemic. And, uh, you know, I am particularly honored to have Brian Payne introducing me because when I was transitioning out of policing into higher ed, Brian was actually my first department chair. And Brian, as he mentioned, sat on my dissertation committee. So at several points, Brian could have made or broken my career. So I guess, uh, you know, who I am today, I could attribute at least part of that to uh, Brian and uh, his tutelage or, or maybe not. Depends on, uh, on how you uh, see that. But thank you for being here. So today we're going to talk about teaching race and justice. And... As we know, the, the line of demarcation for virtually everything in this country happened on the 25th of May of last year with the uh, murder of George Floyd. And as we move forward, we saw tons of protests and we saw uh, some rioting. There's a lot of police reform, but a lot of that worked its way into the classroom because a lot of the folks that were protesting, a lot of the people that were angry are college age people. And if your, your campus was anything like my campus, that made its way into the classroom almost immediately. Uh, summer classes, we were dealing with it. And as we were going through the summer, um, I got elevated from the provost's office into uh, the vice presidency to handle DEI issues on my campus. And a lot of my colleagues said, you need to help. We don't know how to address this issue. We don't know how to have the race uh, conversation in class. And a lot of my colleagues were saying, because I feel uncomfortable, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to totally avoid it. We're going to talk about something else. And I was trying to let them know that that actually is more harmful than you at least trying. So over the summer, myself and uh, one of the deans sat down and redesigned a new course, um, part of the, uh, the common course that everybody takes at the university, and we dubbed it the uncommon course. And we spent a lot of time talking about how do you introduce race and privilege and bias into the classroom, because that's what our students wanted to, uh, to talk about. So we're going to talk about it. I'm going to take you through in the next half hour I'm gonna take you through 15 weeks worth of stuff, but I'm gonna give you a couple of different uh, dimensions because one way we're gonna teach you the kind of the upfront in your face way of teaching race. And then we're gonna also teach a more subtle um, approach to teaching race. Because those of you that have known me and I've been in ACJS, this is I guess my 25th year. 
I've changed a lot from who I used to be to who I am now. And I was definitely a whole lot of Malcolm, but at this point in my life, I'm a lot more Mel uh, Martin. So the changes um, are depicted in the classroom. And there are some people that want to talk race, that want to be in your face with it and hold people accountable. And that's fine. Other people want to kind of walk back in and make everything a teachable moment. So I'm going to try to give you some techniques on, uh, on both sides. I'm going to go through uh, pretty quickly, but um, I believe this is being recorded. So you'll have an opportunity to uh, go back and view this. And at the end, I'm going to stop and give 10 or 15 minutes um, for some Q&A. So in the classroom, when we start off, before we do anything else, we have to set up some ground rules. Typically, when we talk about race, our world, the college, is a monolithic group and we teach outwardly. When we start teaching race now, we are making it more self-reflective. It's not just about those people. It's not just about Black people out there or Latinx people or white people out there. We're starting it um, with how I view things because we can no longer leave people in a safe space. We need to make everybody... Uh, understand the level of discomfort that's going on. And we start off by telling people, use I statements. Don't tell me what they're doing. Don't tell me what you heard or those people. Talk about yourself, active listening. Don't tell us about other people, but we have to recognize and respect each other even when we disagree. And it's about learning the lived experience of other people. Ultimately, the objective is to increase levels of empathy and increase levels of compassion in the classroom. And again, if, or if you folks are at all like I am, I try to make my classroom a really safe space for people so we can open up and have these conversations. Even when people disagree, we still need people not to be disagreeable. We still need to make it a teachable situation. So when we teach about race and justice in 2021, there are two approaches that I'm going to talk about. One, the direct kind of in your face method. And the other one is the indirect method. And I'm going to start with the direct method, because that's what people are thinking we need to go. There are some folks that when I say I'm trying to build bridges, they say we're at the point now where we're tired of building bridges, we need to start tearing sh stuff down and getting people to where they need to be. And I get it. That's personally not where I am today. But there are still people that are there. So we're going to address that as, as well. But if you think of this subject kind of in a medical model, the learning process needs to be two things. One, it needs to be diagnostic, then it needs to be prescriptive. And if you think about when there's something wrong with you, when you walk into your doctor's office, the first thing, they don't walk in and just write you a prescription and send you home. They try to diagnose the problem first. They try to figure out what's going on, stop that, and then put out a prescription to try to make things better. The diagnostic part is we have to acknowledge the problem. We have to acknowledge the harm that has been done. This is historic in nature. We can't say to black and brown people, I get what used to happen, but today we got to heal and move forward. There is no healing and moving forward until you acknowledge that people have been wronged in this country. People continue to be wronged by the criminal justice system, by policing, by the health system. We have to acknowledge that there are harms. Once you acknowledge people's harms, then you can be prescriptive and talking about a pathway forward. But in order for us to talk about a pathway forward, we have to stop the harm. We have to start leveling the playing field. And that's how the healing part of it begins. But again, if we're going direct, let's start off with the fact that in America, we have a really convenient history. The American history tends to be a revisionist history. It tends to accentuate American superiority in that point of view. Remember, in America, in the US, we even refer to the whole continent as us, even though there are multiple countries in America, but the American perspective is ours. We don't have to learn other languages. Everybody else needs to learn English. And for even when we travel abroad, we expect people to learn English. We don't even care to learn other languages as we, as we uh, go about our lives. 
but also in the convenient history of America. It dismisses the fact that a lot of the successes in America was built on the back of black people. At every single point since 1619 moving forward, the vast majority of the labor, the free labor in this country was on the backs of black people. So we have to start at the point where people were wronged, people of color were wronged as soon as they got to this country. And the funny thing is when we talk about the constitution and we hold all things Americana, we always go back to these truths we hold self-evident that all men are created equal. But the irony is the people who wrote those words, all men are created equal, those men own slaves. So we have to acknowledge the generational harm that's been done in this country time and time and time and time again before we can expect people to heal and move forward. Great quote from uh, Michelle Obama when she was the first lady of our country. She says, it's not lost on her that she wakes up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. But that's an inconvenient history that we don't want to talk about. And it's funny that slavery happened for, for so many hundreds of years, but yet we relegate it to two or three chapters in a history book because we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to learn that level of history. I was watching Jeopardy at some point during the lockdown, and this was the College Jeopardy Grand Championship. And as they were going through the questions, African-American history was one of the questions, and I was waiting for it. And they cleared the whole board before they even attempted to try African-American history. And I was taken aback by that. And it, it's dawned on me that through K through 12 and through college, unless you purposefully take an African-American history class or take a black history class, you're not gonna really learn a lot of black history. And that's part of the problem because we relegate black history as to something that's different. So let's move forward a little bit. When we talk about Jackie Robinson and Jackie Robinson day is, uh, is coming up, Major League Baseball, everybody wears the number 42. When we talk about Jackie Robinson, everybody says Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball. So that's his legacy because he was exceptional. Jackie Robinson was special. You know, finally one of them had what it take to play with us. But here's the subtext that when we say that, what we're actually saying is that the subtext is levels of inferiority. So if we talk about how we say things, because words do matter, because the truth is Jackie Robinson was actually the first black people, the white people allowed to play major league baseball. So we can't go through the process of learning unless we acknowledge things the way they are, because racism is a system. It's not just an event. So we can't just start with George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Maude Aubrey or uh, Michael Brown or Botham John or you know, any number of cases. We need to acknowledge that the system is problematic. So when we talk about race, it's really okay to say, we're not talking about you personally, we need to acknowledge that the system in the US is broken. So if we want to move forward, this kind of in your face, let's lay down some ground rules, let's let people understand. Great book by Robin D'Angelo. If you haven't read it, my suggestion, if you're interested in teaching issues of race, go ahead and read the uh, book, White Fragility. And some of the ex excerpts, she says that many white people in America feel personally insulated from racial stress and often entitled to their level of privilege. They don't have to talk about race or think about race in their daily lives. They seldom experience racial discomfort in society because they are the majority. So because of that, just like when you go, if you don't go to the gym, your muscles aren't working, you don't get stamina, you're not building your car cardio. According to uh, Robin D'Angelo, there's a lot of white people that haven't built up racial stamina. So when we breach the subject of race, the first thing they throw up is, oh, you're playing the race card. Any challenge to their racial worldview is seemed to be a challenge to their very identity as a good person. And they automatically equate, if I disagree, if I have a different perspective, then you're challenging me as a person. They become emotionally fragile in conversations about race because they're not used to talking about it. And I was having a conversation um, a couple of months ago with our cabinet. We talked about the issue of race. 
and I asked the question of my cabinet, when was the last time somebody brought up your race and somebody defiantly said, you know, a couple of weeks ago at the store and I kind of chuckled, I go, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. I said twice today, somebody mentioned my blackness and we haven't even broken for lunch yet. Understanding that black and brown people in this country, the BIPOC people, black, indigenous and other people of color deal with the issue of race every single day. And it's unfortunate because a lot of people are feeling racial battle fatigue, that there's vicarious trauma that a lot of black and brown people are feeling because of the negative stuff that happens in society. And it's terrible that white America, white faculty, white allies will tend to shy away from it. When we talk about race, well, we're gonna call it diversity because it's gonna make us feel a little bit better. We also need to talk about levels of microaggression because a lot of people don't understand. Microaggressions, a brief commonplace daily verbal behavior or environmental indignity, whether or not you intend, that communicates levels of hostility, it's derogatory or negative attitudes towards culturally marginalized group. And I gotta tell you folks, black people don't want you touching their hair. Just write that down. The first time you think, oh, look at Lorenzo's hair, it's so curly. So just don't, don't. In general, folks don't want you touching their hair. And I would say people in general don't want you going around touching them. But think about some of the questions that you ask when you meet somebody. Hey, where are you from? I'm from so-and-so. Really? They give you the side eye. Where are you really from? Or so like, so like, what are you? Like I'm human. What is that supposed to mean? Or you're the whitest black person that I know. Or you're just so articulate. These things are all microaggressions because your assumption is something different. Your assumption is something less and that becomes problematic. So that's a thumbnail sketch of the direct method of teaching race. Putting people on point, letting them know different terms, telling them what's expected, setting them where they need to be as far as a knowledge base, because a lot of people say, I don't have basic knowledge. So there's a lot of black and brown people that'll say, okay, let me give you the basic knowledge. Let me let you understand how I live. And that's a direct way of doing it. But the indirect method, we just started doing this at uh, my university. We decided to rethink the way we taught our classes. So we designed the course to highlight the process the, the key is the process by which people assign social value to elements of things that people couldn't decide. We discussed this process in the classroom and we let it become guided by other people's backgrounds and other people's history. So this becomes introspective. It's about how you view the world and how you view things. Various histories and perspectives and the context of showing an accurate picture of the US and its population, their struggles and privileges. Because when there's struggle on one side, there's privilege on the other side. And then we talk about why we assign social value to things that, uh, that people couldn't decide. And then we determine that, you know, that's really dysfunctional. Because, you know, I go through my class and I'll ask, we're, we live in Connecticut. So I say, by a show of hands, how many people were born in Connecticut? A lot of people raised their hand. How many people chose to be born in Connecticut? How many people chose the race of their parents? How many people chose the socioeconomic status that they were born into? How many people chose the gender that they were assigned at birth? It's very different. We can definitely assign value to things that the decisions that people make. Like I always wonder, how is it that anybody possibly could be a Yankee fan? If you're a Yankee fan, to me, being from Boston, there's something deficient. You chose to be a Yankee fan. It is what it is. But you didn't choose to be black. You didn't choose to be female. You didn't choose to be 6'1". Guys that are balding, you don't choose that haircut. So we shouldn't add value to things that people didn't decide. 
So at the end of the course, and when we talk to our faculty that are building out this course, we start with the syllabus and we start with at the end. What are they gonna get at the end? And then we build things uh, forward. By the end of the class, they'll be able to identify when you've applied social value to elements that people couldn't decide. They get to explain the assignment of social value. They appraise the important part of helping and not harming. And it's a self check. At what point am I doing something that's harmful? At what point in this class, based on my comment, based on the way I ask a question, based on the things that I assert in my paper, at what point am I adding harm? And we spend a lot of time doing it. And this is a freshman class. So your very first semester, right out of high school, these are the things that we talk about. And we spend a lot of time uh, dealing with this in the classroom. So traits, decisions, attitudes, and beliefs are the things that we talk about. And the funny thing is here, you notice we didn't talk about race. Race is not one of the things listed. But when you talk about traits, decisions, attitudes, and beliefs, it works its way back to race. It always comes back to race and culture. So this is the indirect way. It's kind of like the Socratic method. By asking questions, you let people arrive at answers. So this way is a little more palatable for people who are not really comfortable talking about issues of race. So what are traits? Traits are things that we didn't choose. Your height, your eye color, your hair color. We do not, or at least we should not place value on things that people didn't choose. But decisions, attitudes, beliefs, we can place value on that. I can place value on how I think you are because of who you chose to vote for. I can place a value on who you choose to root for. I can place a value on that, but I cannot place a value on things that you could not uh, decide. So here's an exercise that, uh, that we do. And I'm gonna ask a couple of people to unmute um, and answer this question for me. I am blank, but that doesn't mean that I'm blank. Mel, can you jump in and, uh, and help with that? Mel first, then Morris, then Charles. I am blank, but that doesn't mean- Okay, hold on. Can you hear me? Yes. I am short, but that doesn't mean I am not athletic. Okay. Charles. Charles, can you get that? Is that me? Yep, that's you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am tall, but that doesn't mean I can play basketball. <laughs> I am tall, but that does not mean that I can play basketball. Yeah, that's not me. All right, right. Excellent. Morris Jenkins, last one. I'm an alumni of Northeastern University, but that doesn't mean I'm a Red Sox fan. Oh, nice. <laughs> Nice. So when we go through this, and we usually go through the whole class and we work through this, because this becomes self-reflective, because the A clause is who you see yourself as. That's the self-reflective part. I see myself as this. The B clause to that line is, how do I think other people see me? Because Charles is tall. We just assume Charles can play basketball or uh, Morris is from Northeastern, God knows why he's not, but he's not a Red Sox fan. So when we do this, it gives people a chance to not only be open about who they are, how they view themselves. The second part is, this is what I think subjectively people are thinking about me. And typically when we go through that, the first part is a trait. And a lot of times the second part is a behavior. And we get to talk about that. We get to distinguish the difference between the trait most of the time. So can I say something about Mel because he's short? Short's relative. 
So can we assign value to Mel because he's short? I can assign value to Mel because he's athletic, or I can assign value to Charles because he can't play basketball, but not the trait part. And as we go through this, inevitably we will get things. And this is the same training I use when I train police officers, because I do about 300 hours a year of training of the police, which is roughly the equivalent of a seven week police academy. And inevitably I'll get somebody to say, I'm black, but that doesn't mean I'm angry. Or then somebody said, well, I'm white, but that doesn't mean I'm a racist. So then the race part is introduced. It's a lot different when you, professor, introduce race into a classroom. It's a lot easier to deal with when the student decides, you know what, I'm comfortable enough to breach this situation. So when you go through this, eventually you'll start getting to, uh, you'll start getting to traits. Then we go into stereotypes, prejudices, and biases. And every picture here invokes some sort of feeling to somebody that's on here right now. And we assume things of people. So I spent almost 15 years in, uh, in law enforcement, but if I have a Blue Lives Matter flag or a Blue Lives Matter face mask, there are people that will think one thing about me. If I've got a Black Lives Matter sign, people are thinking something very different. If I've got a Confederate flag, yet a third thing. So we make stereotypes based on the imagery that we see. So if this was a small class, and we usually do classes of 20 or fewer, and certainly it doesn't work with you know, the hundred or so people that are here, I usually go through the class and I say, give me a stereotype. And they give me a bunch of things and I'll say, oh, that's a bias. And well, note this, that's a bias, because I'll say, give me a stereotype. What I'm looking for are things like, boys like trucks, girls like dolls. Loud talkers can be easily heard. People from Boston have accents. Basketball players are tall, stereotype. Second category, biases. Asians are good at math. People with red hair are angry. Blondes, fill in your blank. Tall people are better at basketball. Old people are bad drivers. So what's the difference between a stereotype and a bias? Because in America, we tend to have these things interchangeably in the US. So the first is not a value judgment. So football being more expensive than basketball, there's not value. There's not a value judgment in that. You have to buy all sorts of equipment. You got to buy cleats. You got to buy helmets. As opposed to basketball, you need a pair of sneakers and you need a ball. So football factually is more expensive than basketball. Boys liking trucks and girls liking dolls. There's no value judgment in that. But Asians are good at math. What happens if you're from the AAPI community and you're not good at math. So what then does that say? Old people are bad drivers. By the fact that we add value right there in the sense, good or bad, liking a truck or liking a doll is not good or bad, but saying that somebody's good at math or a bad driver that adds a value. So we differentiate between stereotypes and biases and typically, it'll come back to race. Because in the US, the default tends to be race. When you get people comfortable enough, they will go back to race. When we talk about stereotypes and prejudices, let's, let's define this. Stereotypes typically exist without social value. People in Boston have accents. Is there a value in that? No, it's just they talk differently. Different is not deficient. Prejudices or biases do in fact contain social value. So if you separate the two, because words matter, words have power. So when we're teaching about race and justice, understand that and justice part is about levels of power and privilege. So make people aware of the words that they use. And we check people in the classroom when they say something, instead of me saying, no, you're wrong. I'll step back and say, is that really what you meant to say? Let's think about that. Or let's unpack that a little bit and see if that's actually what you meant. Because when you're teaching about race, 
particularly now because it's such a lightning rod, if we are able to al allow people to retain the level of dignity, then we can work through it. If somebody says something and I stick an accusatory finger in their face and say, no, you're a racist, they're going to automatically shut down. I lost the opportunity to teach them. I lost the opportunity to make them a better person. Instead of me saying you're wrong, if I stop with, that's interesting. Let's unpack that. Let's walk through that. Again, it's the Socratic method, letting them get to their answers. When we're trying to defeat stereotypes and prejudices, be open to learning, be open to growth. Don't try to affirm the thoughts when you're challenged with other evidence. Sometimes things are what they are. Defeating prejudices, recognize the bias that are contained in social values. Think where this bias originates. If you think old people are bad drivers, where's that coming from in you? What's the bias that you have and how then do you define old? I was talking to my grandson the other day and he said that somebody was like really, really old. And I said, how old? And he goes, I don't know, maybe 30. They were really old. Defining what we're talking about before we assign a judgment or a value to it, it helps people uh, to think about it. Take some time, listen, reflect. Unfortunately, in many of the arguments, people aren't listening to be heard. They're listening in order to respond. And then it's no longer a, a, a debate back and forth. It becomes two monologues where people are talking at each other. Consider what value you get from holding this uh, social value. Why is it important to you to believe that Asians are good at math? Why is that important to you to think that old people are poor drivers. Why is it important to hold that? And if you start talking to people about that, letting them unpack that, they'll realize how dysfunctional a lot of what their beliefs are. And we talk about pride and privilege. Another exercise we do in the class, I'm not gonna do it here for the sake of time. We ask the question, what are you proud of? And then somebody will say, well, I'm proud of this, or I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of graduating. I'm proud of being the first in my family. And eventually, as you keep going through, eventually they're going to come up with a trait. Some of the times their behaviors, attitudes, and uh, decisions, but eventually traits are going to emerge. And then somebody eventually is going to say, you know what? I'm proud to be Black. And they're going to say, yeah. So then there's gonna be that guy in the room that says, oh yeah, I'm proud to be white. So here's my question for you folks. Are they saying the same thing? If a person says to you, I'm proud to be black and somebody else says, well, I'm proud to be white. In the society in the United States, does that mean the same thing? Are they saying they're proud to be white or are they really saying, I see what you go through and I'm really glad I'm not black. Or if somebody says, you know, I'm really proud to be a female and guys, well, I'm proud to be a guy. Are you saying you're proud that you don't have to go through the negative stuff that females have to go through? Because just saying the opposite doesn't mean you're saying the same thing. Sometimes you're saying, when I'm saying that I'm black, I'm proud to be black. Sometimes I'm saying, you know what? Based on what's going on in the US, I'm not ashamed to be black. Because as we go through our history, there was a period of time going through the 50s and into the early 60s that social, um, the social movements and the media and music had to reinforce, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. We had to get to that point because there's so many people through the history of our country have disparaged anything that's not white. So the question is, what are people saying when they tell you what they're proud of? Because the more you go through this, you don't have to say a word about race. And I taught this class last fall, not one time did I introduce race into the conversation, but after the first couple of weeks, every class we talked about either race or gender and class and culture, or almost every class we talked about that. And I didn't introduce it at all. And it became easier for the students because we gave them this space. And for me, it wasn't teaching. 
It was more me facilitating, me asking probing questions or me asking leading questions or asking them to, to delve deeper into what they're saying. And if people are saying, well, I'm not ashamed to be black, or I'm not ashamed to be Hispanic, I'm not ashamed to be bilingual, then they start thinking, should I be? Why would I be ashamed to be that? And not only are you talking about issues of race, but you're also building people's self-confidence because you're helping them, helping them to realize the beauty of what they say and of who they are. There's a form of privilege being black and, and, and we do a lot of code switching because you know we talk about crime being a function of young people and male and densely populated areas densely populated areas became urban areas and then we did the code switching so who's likely to be criminal became young urban male and black because we do code switching but we don't do that with whites and it's funny that we have a term black on black crime, but we don't have a white on white crime, which makes it really hard because that's a false equivalency because crime is intra-racial. When black people are victimized, they're gonna be victimized typically by black people, but when white people are victimized, they tend to be victimized by white people. So having a term black on black crime is counterproductive to what we're trying to do. And it just skews away from what's actually happening. So ultimately, I'm going to wrap up quickly. In order for this to work, you have to build a collegial classroom. I'd like to reimagine the classroom with the holistic approach because my job is not to get people to understand something in a book or in an article. I'm trying to get people to embrace who they are as people. And it's a four-step process that we use here at the University of New Haven to do this. One is we try to increase levels of compassion. Try to get people to have concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others, particularly for those that are privileged. Number two is empathy. Understand that people are going through something. Understand that people are not similarly situated. Understanding that the school system in Bel Air or in Beverly Hills is very different than the school system in Compton. So it's not enough to say, well, everybody gets free schooling. It's not the same. Understanding that. Number three is communications, avoiding microaggressions through effective creative communication. Number four, critical thinking skills. We try to get students to go beyond the emotion and see the real issue. We try to get our students to become problem solvers. We tell the students it's no longer okay just to be non-racist because being non-racist is passive. We need people to be actively anti-racist. When we try to reimagine education, how do you change behaviors? Change by repetition and by mimicking good behavior. In our classrooms, we do a lot of role play. We give a scenario and we have people act out various things, scenario-based learning. Because if somebody just sits in the classroom and just writes for 50 minutes and then gets up and leaves, how much are they gonna retain? Versus if you do some scenarios and we do a lot of scenarios uh, in our classroom get them involved and do it regularly. You can't just do it that one time and then let it go. Do it regularly because this helps people think about what they're doing. The objectives for a reimagined classroom, improve communications, improve crisis intervention skills, provide specific skills training on how to overcome communication barriers and conflict. And it's funny that you think there's no communication barrier if people both speak English, but I had a, a young lady, African-American female, who was as progressive as I'd seen an 18-year-old. And then there was a young Caucasian male who was about as conservative as I thought a young kid could be. And the two of them were at each other every single class. But we kept working through it and kept working through it. So at the end of the class, they had to do a final presentation. And these two students asked if they can do a presentation together. And my first thought was, no, you guys are going to kill each other. But I said, let's unpack that. So the, we started to talk, and the young lady said, this guy is complete opposite. He dislikes everything that I'm about. He's a huge Trump supporter. I disagree. But now, because we had a chance to talk, at least I understand, I disagree. And the, the young man who was a diehard Trump supporter said, 
everything that she stands for, I disagree with, but at least now I know why she stands on the position that she stands and they were willing to have conversation. So I'm not trying to change political views. I'm just trying to get people to understand the perspective of other people. I'm trying to help them develop cultural competence, increase dialogue, increase engagement. If I'm talking at the front of the room, the kids will learn a little bit, but if I can guide and facilitate the conversation and get them talking to each other, get them to understand the learned experience of each other in the classroom, particularly in that diverse classroom, that's where learning happens. And that's how we improve relationships and cooperation. And repeat, do it over and over and over again. Teaching this class helped me rethink. So 21 years I've been teaching at the university level, but teaching this one class the way we designed it has changed the way I teach virtually anything. The building blocks of understanding, awareness, tolerance, appreciation, engagement, again, repetition. You see what I'm saying? The more we do it, the more we give them voice, the more we give them a chance to talk, but it has to be guided. You have to guide them. You have the information walk them through. Don't be a teacher, become a facilitator. We take them through the um, restoration process. We're trying to improve and repair relationships. We're trying to build a healthy classroom, increase social capital. The aim of the restorative process is to develop a sense of community at our university, whether the University of New Haven chargers. So I'm trying to build community and charger nation. I'm trying one, to get them to repair harm because there's a lot of harm and two, to build relationships moving forward. So this restorative process is both reactive and proactive. The proactive part is about building relationships and developing community inside the classroom. The reactive part is understanding that the system is pretty jacked up and that bad things have happened to people in the system. There's all sorts of bias in the system. Once we acknowledge people's pain, then we can move forward and start the healing process. Learning from each other, be flexible, be forgiving, be prepared because people are going to challenge you. People don't know what they don't know. So give them a chance because there's a level of privilege that people are living. And, and here's, here's the quote, here's, here's Lorenzo's quotable moment. There are some people so used to privilege that equality feels like oppression. They're so used to privilege that equality feels like oppression. So if you tweet that out today, make sure you tag me in that. Reinforce positive behavior by repetition. Be flexible, use gender neutral and inclusive language. Be aware of your nonverbal cues, giving and receiving. Acknowledge trust issues. Acknowledge that people have been jacked up for a really long time. Acknowledge that people's parents and grandparents went through some really nasty stuff in this country and they're telling the young folks as well. Avoid generational cultural references. Be patient with people. There we are. I will not, I know that was really, really, really fast, but it's being recorded. So hopefully there um, you guys can go back to this. So I am willing to take questions, Jessica. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. We had several questions come through uh, while you were speaking. So I'm just going to share those in the order that they were sent in. Uh, so Morris Jenkins uh, pointed out, he said, I know you're a baseball fan, but Jackie Robinson was not the first black allowed to play Major League Baseball. It was Moses Fleetwood Walker. Uh, he also pointed out just the fact of dealing with systemic racism and how important that is. And his question was, should our white allies talk about race rather than black scholars? Okay. Yes. I'm aware that Jackie wasn't the first, but he was the first that white people labeled as the one that broke the color barrier. And should our white allies talk about race? I think the more we can get people talking about race, the better it's going to be. And we shouldn't put the burden of learning and teaching issues of race on people of color. It should be everybody because a lot of people of color are, are going through racial battle fatigue. And I keep getting tired of telling my white colleagues over and over and over again, fill in the blank. So the more we can get allies to talk about it as well, the better it's gonna be. Great. 
Uh, Alison Butterfield said uh, that she wanted to discuss the police reform legislation in Maryland with her law enforcement class this morning, but nobody wanted to talk about it. She said that's despite the fact that she knew at least half her students would likely be against it. So her question was, how do I get students to discuss the issues when I think we've been socialized to stay quiet and not engage in heated subjects like this? Uh, so any suggestions you have about how she can engage her students and get them to speak out. Uh, she also said just adding that element of trying to accomplish this on Zoom, right? Particularly when students don't have cameras on. Um, and if you wanted to share your thoughts on the legislation as well. Well, Allison, great questions. Um, it's much, 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 much harder in Zoom. And for those that know me personally, you know that what I do works way better face-to-face -face than on Zoom, but, but you try to make it work. But the thing I can tell you, um, your students up in Providence, Allison, is build a safe space for them. And I subscribe to a theory that I call teaching naked, which means I'm transparent in what I say and what I do. I let them know the mistakes that I make. I let them know my foibles. And the more you say, you know, I'm human, I make these mistakes. These are things I used to think, but now I think this. So the more you're transparent in the classroom and tell it's okay to make mistakes. So when somebody says something wrong, instead of me saying, no, you're wrong, I say, that's interesting. Let's unpack that. Let's talk about this. Because the more you tell people it's safe to talk about issues, then I think it's it's a good thing. And the last question, I think you know how I feel about the police reform legislation. I think um, all states need to go in that direction. And I'm one of the people that try to push it as much as I do work with the uh, Congressional Black Caucus. Yeah, we absolutely need police reform and I'm trying to help drive that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Van Horn asked, what methods do you find are the best to change the often white male white privilege perspective that they don't have privilege. And she said she's just had so many struggles in her CJ class with that lack of social awareness. You know, that that is dependent on your relationship. And it's about relationship building. I had a, a faculty member at another university that uh, was having issues and I, I decided to talk to him and and older guy. And I said, well, tell me what the problem is. And he says, you know, I, I don't know what they want anymore. I don't get them. And they're just different. And I kind of chuckled and said, yeah, the millennials. He goes, no, the coloreds. I was like, oh. Now about 27 different things ran through my head and I went straight Malcolm X in my head. And I go, no way. So I said to him, you got a few minutes? I go, let me buy you a cup of coffee. Let's take a walk. We took a walk over to the, um, the coffee shop bought him a cup of coffee and we sat for about an hour talking and I walked him through lived experience and he realized that his position was archaic and antiquated. If you do that in a classroom with people, people wanna save face. So sometimes just the one-on-one -on -one conversations or just trying to explain, we're not talking about you, we're talking about others. I use examples from other universities all the time. I use sports examples all the time, but you gotta, you know, I get in trouble when I say this, but you got to walk people gently through this. And I know people are going to say, well, for 200 years, we've been gentle with them. It's time for us to, I get that. You know, the reason that I believe uh, that Martin was so effective, because the alternative was Malcolm. And, you know, you got to, you got to try both ways, but you got to walk them through it and not be accusatory. Okay. Uh, Mel said, and I, I hope I'm not uh, butchering this, Sklonik, S-K-O-L-N-I-C-K, said that we are all prejudiced in some ways, but it does not mean we are racist. Was he correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, people have levels of prejudice. What are your prejudices based on? If your prejudices are based on race, it'll definitely, it's a slippery slope towards racism. But a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And a lot of people, when I, when I travel outside the country a lot, people tell me my view of black people in the US is, and then they list whatever the show is. So people get their view of things differently and people don't know what they don't know. So the more you introduce them to new concepts, uh, new people, new ideas, then you can start to diminish that. And people can be prejudiced without specifically being racist 
although that becomes a slippery slope. Mel also asked, I hear male students say that they don't want to take a gender studies class because it becomes a male bashing session. How can we avoid discussions on race becoming a white bashing session? So the way we're teaching the uncommon course by uh, traits, values, and behaviors is one way you can do that. But the flip side is let's acknowledge, remember it needs to be diagnostic before it becomes prescriptive. We have to acknowledge the harms and let's acknowledge that the, the, the relationship between the police and the community, ever since black people were brought to this country in 1619, there's been a negative relationship with authority people on horses with guns that became the police, goes all the way back to slave patrols moving forward. So we can't say, you know, we're not gonna talk about that. We're just gonna talk about moving forward because your white students or your students that are not knowledgeable or the ones that feel a certain way are gonna kind of push you forward. But the students that feel like that they were harmed, the students of color, the students that identify, the students that are aware of the history, you're gonna lose them completely. So you have to be open and honest about it and understand you gotta acknowledge some harms and you gotta say, you know what? Sometimes my people sucked and we're moving forward. We're not going to continue that action because the diagnostic part is not just acknowledging the harms but it's stopping the harm. And then the prescriptive part is moving forward. Great. Then we had several comments about the restorative justice idea and just uh, people feeling like they just need the skills and the knowledge to know how to do that. Uh, Toya, Toya, I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, asked, is restorative practices used within the classroom as a model? And does your university offer curriculum in the process, including effective language? Um, we've got faculty members that, well, yes, it is being used in the classroom. Some people are but a lot of people don't understand the restorative process. So the three or four faculty members out of the nearly thousand faculty members that we have, there are three or four of them that are trying to do it and do it really well. And then they're trying to teach. And, and let's remember, earning my PhD didn't make me a good teacher. It made me a subject matter expert. The pedagogy, I had to stumble through that and work through that and learn that. And I still learn. Teaching 20 years, this summer, I learned a whole new pedagogy, and we need to continue doing that. Great. Uh, someone else had asked about book recommendations. So several people put in some excellent book recommendations in the chat. So I would say if you have a great book recommendation, uh, feel free to put that in the chat as well. Um, I, you know, I couldn't find a, a question in there. There was some discussion back and forth just about the role of slave patrols and 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 what that then led to for modern policing. Um, so there was some discussion of that in the chat. I couldn't really distill that into a question. Um, though I think it, that, that debate even just kind of highlights just kind of sometimes the difficulties of communicating across these subjects. So. In my history of policing class, I spend a lot of time talking about the slave patrols and how there are still remnants of the slave patrols in modern policing. And I tell people the, uh, the badge that I wore on my chest for 14 years, the five point star is the same badge or a version of the same badge the slave patrollers wore. We can, we can debate that. I have a whole class that I, that I teach on that. But the, the other thing I wanted to mention is I don't need people to agree with me. I just need people to understand that there's another way of doing things. And half of the people will say, you know what? I can't do that, uh, that direct thing. I just can't do that. Then there are other people that are gonna say that indirect, that's selling out. You gotta go right at them. And I'm okay either way. The point is that you're here, you're in this workshop because you care about it. Keep learning, keep reading, keep trying other methods. And if you can take one point from anything I said and use it effectively in the classroom, then I think it's, it's worthwhile. But the fact that you want to learn, you want to continue, and you want to go, because what, what Mo does at Cal State Fullerton may be very, very different than what Brian does at Old Dominion. So different audiences, different students, private schools. I spent half my career teaching at HBCU. So what I do in historically Black schools are very, very different than what I do in this upper middle class white private institution that I'm in. So you have to learn different methods. And the more you learn it, you'll see what works for you. And more importantly, you'll find out what works for your students. 
you are muted still. Thank you. <laughs> First of the day. I, I think that covers all the questions. Uh, we do have a survey you can complete. This is how we'll be taking attendance to make sure everyone gets their certificate for completing this workshop. So please make sure you follow the link um, that I am putting in the chat right now. It was also included in the email that I sent. And I just want to apologize to everyone who accidentally joined this call on Teams. We had to switch to Zooms once we got uh, Lorenzo on board since that's what his university could use. So thank you so much for everybody for sticking with us through that and for getting over to Zoom. And we just really look forward to seeing you all at our future workshops. Thank you folks so much. For those that are interested, I'll be on our Core TV tonight at 9.30 East Coast time. And be nice to people. Thank you folks. Thank you all. <laughs>